pages over to 16b. Preserve me, O God. We're going to sing verses 1, 4, and 5. 1, 4, and 5. A very warm welcome. Very warm welcome to all of you here in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you are visiting this evening, we're very happy to have you with us. And it's our hope and our prayer that together we will be encouraged by the word of the Lord and that the Spirit will move us to respond to his good word. Our call to worship this evening is from Psalm 149. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker, let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let's take a few moments now in silent prayer and ask for God's blessing on our worship. Let us pray. Let us stand. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help is from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 
Let's turn in our Psalter hymnals to number 324. God himself is with us. One of the names of Christ is Emmanuel. God is with us. We'll sing the three stanzas with the amen at the end, and we'll sing stanza two a cappella. All three stanzas, stanza two a cappella. Let us now confess what we believe. Our faith is based upon the Word of God as He has revealed it to us in Scripture. We use tonight the words of the Apostles' Creed. And let each one say, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our song of response is number 48. Number 48, Jehovah is my light and my salvation near. A setting of Psalm 27, number 48, we'll sing just the first three stanzas.
responsive reading this evening, we turn in the back of our Bible to Selection 44. You can find that on page 1,351. This responsive reading, number 44, is drawn from John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another. As I have loved you, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. That you should bear bear my fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Let us pray. Lord, again, you have summoned us into your presence. As a father calls his children to himself, so you have called us to come into your presence, to join our hearts and our voices and our lives with that great worshiping community that is above. For we have come to the heavenly Zion, the Jerusalem that is above, and there we join with all your people around the throne of Christ Jesus our Lord, the Lamb that was slain, but the Lamb that is very, very much alive, never to die again. And so we take our place, Father, as this congregation here with the many, many congregations around this world where worship has begun at the beginning of this day, continues on until the end of this day, but also a worship which is uh, purified and sanctified by the, the saints above who have gone into glory and who even now experience the joy at your right hand and the pleasures forevermore that begins already now. And Father, together we cry out with that church, how long? How long must we wait until the very end comes? And we also pray, Father, moved by your Spirit to say, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. For we live in a world that is darkened by sin, where news reports tell us of wars and rumors of war, of the threats of violence and violence that is actually carried out, of the misery, the absolute misery that we have brought upon one another in our hatred for one another in our hatred for you. For Father, the sin that we see in this world is not first of all a sin against our neighbor. It is against you, the God who created all things perfectly, the God who has made known to us your perfect will in the scriptures. And yet, Father, by nature, by a nature we have received from the first Adam, we hate you and we hate our neighbor. And so, gracious God, give us pause tonight that the Jews who had your law, who might teach people not to steal themselves, steal, who say thou shalt not commit adultery, commit adultery. 
your people who have received your word, and that's true even among us, we still also stumble in so many ways. The weakness of the flesh or out, outright hypocrisy, whereby we make a profession of the faith, and yet we have no interest really in living the life that we talk about. But Father, even the Gentiles too, in their search for God, fail to find the true God. And they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And their hearts come to rest upon something in creation, upon a creature. And they begin to worship the things of this world. And when that happens, the behavior, the ethics of humanity degenerates. And people find all kinds of pleasure in perversity and applaud those who do it. And so we, we see what you say in the book of Romans, that there is no one who is righteous, no, not even one, that at the hearing of your law we all stop short, but a righteousness apart from the law, but attested to by the law and the prophets has now been revealed, because now a righteousness that is perfect and complete in every way has been revealed in your own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so tonight, we lift up our hearts and our voices in praise to you, Lord Jesus, your willingness to lay aside your glory, your willingness to take on the form of a servant and be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We glorify, we boast in the cross, because that is where our salvation is found. There, the great debt that we have accumulated, the great debt that we increase every day, has been paid in full. And your righteousness, Lord Jesus, is now ours, not because we feel it, not because we have done just enough good works to to meet the minimum standard, no. Your righteousness is a free and perfect gift to us, and we can only receive it with thanksgiving and in humility, because when we look at ourselves, we still see that we still sin, and we see that our conscience even testifies against us. And we cry out, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will save me from this dead body? But thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for the plan of salvation that you have accomplishing, that you are working out even now through your Spirit, is so perfect in every way. Our debts are paid at the cross. The grave from which we pull back, none of us want to die, but Father, the fear, the sting of death has been taken away because your Son, dear Father, Christ our Lord, has conquered death. The grave has been sanctified for us. It is only a transition from this world to the next world as we await with great patience but anticipation the resurrection of the dead. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe that these bodies will be changed, transformed, and made to fit into your new creation. You will not abandon your Holy One to see corruption, but you will call us forth in the end. Transform us by the power of your grace. Gracious God, all things are ours. You are even now, Lord Jesus, preparing a place for us. You ever live to intercede for us. You are waiting until your enemies become the footstool of your feet. Lord Jesus, you truly are the victor of history. You are the winner against all of your enemies. And so when we face all kinds of opposition in this world, and Father, we hardly know what that kind of persecution is like in our own country, though there be many forces that line up against the church, we don't really experience the kind of brutality that many of our brothers and sisters face. We know that in the end, You, Lord Jesus, have conquered. In this world, we will have tribulation. You, Lord Jesus, reminded us of that, but we are of good cheer. We take heart, for you have overcome this world. And so, gracious God, we pray for the church as it experiences your grace in this world. We pray, Lord, for every every pastor, missionary, every means that have become available to us through printed word, through proclamation, Uh, through radio and uh, television, media, uh, to spread the gospel. We pray, Father, that that word may fall upon receptive ears and hearts, 
that all those who are destined to receive everlasting life, those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, will receive that word, and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, they may believe, and in believing, their lives may change quickly, but definitely in a way in which we become more and more conformed to the image of your Son. And so, Father, we pray for all those efforts that are now in exploring the possibility of planting a new congregation, a Reformed congregation in Sioux City. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing upon that, that there may be an interested core of people who want to hear the Word of God as that is confessed in our confessions, want to hear the gospel proclaimed and and spread that news to that city as well. We pray for that. We pray, Father, for all the plans and preparations that are going into a biblical counseling center in Sioux Falls. We ask for your blessing upon that so that even that way and through those means, uh, a way can be found to bring the healing of your word, the balm that soothes the misery and the pain that sin has brought into the lives of many individuals and into the lives of many homes. For Father, we need to look inside our own hearts We need to look around us, and we do see just how deep and painful the brokenness that exists because of sin, the misery that sin has brought into this world. But your word shows the way. Your spirit is the power that can change and transform us. We believe that. And so, Father, help us uh, even through a counseling center, but also as individuals to learn how to listen to one another to listen really to the issues that are at play in people's lives, to pray for one another, to speak words of encouragement, a word in season, to give the cup of cold water in the name of Jesus so that people may be encouraged to turn away from sinful attitudes and practices and to find hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for those who are lonely, who think that the world has forsaken them, And to remind them, uh, help to remind them of the promise that you have given to us in your word, that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. Truly, Lord Jesus, your name is Emmanuel. God is with us. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon all those efforts to establish a mission work uh, in the Latino community here in Northwest Iowa. We're thankful that these people are our neighbors, that they are with us. We work with them. And we pray, Father, that the spreading of the gospel also in that community uh, may be accomplished. And so, Father, bless those efforts to bring the the holy gospel uh, to our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers in the Latino community as well. Father, for those people who are fleeing Afghanistan or any other theater of war and conflict, and if they come to settle in our country, gracious God, don't leave them to the mercy of of the secularists, but let your people be in the front to bring to them words of hope from Scripture, the gospel of Jesus, and the love, the love that you have showed to us first of all, but love that can be demonstrated in meeting physical needs, in helping them to become settled, in learning that chaos is not the norm, but rather the norm is what your word shows, that we seek the shalom and the peace and the well-being that belongs to the kingdom of God. We can only taste it here in a little bit, in small doses, but that taste creates in us a craving and a longing for that most perfect world that you have said is coming. And so, Father, we are so thankful for the gospel that reaches us, unworthy as we are, but a gospel that also claims us so that we might become citizens of a never-ending kingdom. We're thankful, Father, for the seasonable rain that we have received in this uh, area. We pray for those parts of our country where there has been drought or perhaps excessive rain. We pray, Father, for seasonable weather that may conclude the season. We think of our coastal areas in the southeast as they or or in the eastern part of our country as they anticipate from time to time uh, very severe storms, hurricanes. 
We pray, Father, that you will avert that kind of physical danger and that, the, that there be a minimum amount of uh, danger and damage. Uh, keep us safe, O oh Lord, not so that we can pursue our own agendas, but keep us safe so that we can work for you and live in peace and in prosperity. We pray, Father, for those who suffer now in Haiti, for those who have experienced the misery of an earthquake and also the misery of, uh, of the weather. O oh Lord, let your people again lead the way in bringing uh, relief and hope and teaching and those physical things that they may need so that there too they may uh, see that we are fed from your hand, we are cared for by your people, and we are loved because you are a God who is good and gracious to us through Jesus Christ and through him alone. We pray for our president that you give to him competence, give to him humility, that he may often, often seek your face, that he might be humbled before you to learn that such a great office requires your wisdom, your power, and your strength, that all of our leaders on the federal, state, and local level will humble themselves and realize that they are merely servants who serve uh, you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, as they serve for the well-being of this people, and that they too, as servants, have to give an account as to how they have conducted themselves in office. We pray for our country as so many conflicting forces at work that seek to pull us apart as a nation. We pray, Lord, for the restoration and the recovery of a greater sense of the wisdom that is found in your word, and that we might return in some way, even in small measures, but we might return to the principles of your word, because righteousness exalts a people, your righteousness, but sin becomes a reproach a terrible danger to any people. And so, Father, help us to uh, fight with courage against the sin in our own lives, to never give in or capitulate, to surrender to the forces of evil. But, Father, help us also to be a witness, a ready witness in the public square of our communities and of our nation to the, to the fact that Jesus is Lord, Christ is King, and that your word is the only way out of the misery in which we find ourselves this day. Lord, we look forward to this coming week. There's a lot of things to do. We're busy people. Our homes are busy. Our children are getting busy again in school. But Father, we are thankful for the callings that we have, and we ask that you will bless us in that work and hear our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. Before we open God's Word, we sing again, but this time we turn to our worship folder to the very first song there, 1B. It is the same psalm that we would have uh, sung in uh, our Psalter hymnals. Uh, the tune is very familiar, 1B, how blessed the man who does not walk where wicked men would guide his feet. We'll stand to sing the three stanzas, 1B.
Our scripture reading this evening comes from the Old Testament, the book of Joshua. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. Of course, Deuteronomy 34 records the, the death of Moses, and so this book is a clear continuation of the story that's been told in Deuteronomy, and this is a period of transition in uh, the leadership that God's people will have. We read together Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over the Jordan, this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I have promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory." No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people... Prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you with a place of rest, and you will, will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. And they answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. This truly is the word of the Lord. I encourage you to keep the passage open as we look at it together this evening. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, we read a familiar story from a a well-traveled book, and so often when we read familiar passages, we can sometimes miss the details. But you are the God who spoke and light shone out of the darkness, and so we ask that you will once again shine the light, illumine your understanding into our hearts. So that your word, as familiar as this story may be, that your word may also resonate within our own hearts and lives and give us direction in our own Christian walk in this day. This we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Dear congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the book of Joshua uh, in this day and age is not a very popular book. It gets a very negative rating. And even though we might be very familiar with many of the stories, what makes this book so negative in modern reading is the perception that this God commanded genocide. 
And let's admit that, yes, God called for the elimination of all the Canaanites. And in this day and age, when the global village is the model, and you sometimes see cars, I've seen them in the Chicago area, I'm not sure you've seen, you have them out here, but you probably do, uh, bumper stickers that say, coexist, coexist, and they use in the lettering of that coexist symbols from a variety of religions. In other words, can't we just all get along, leave each other alone and just coexist together? The global village is the model and therefore a story in which God commands the elimination of the Canaanites is a scandal. This book, Joshua, gets a very negative rating. What people forget, however, if I may just give an aside, is that if you read Deuteronomy 20, there clearly God commands a behavior of war that is quite pro-life. He says in Deuteronomy 20, when you go up against a city, this would be outside of Canaan, offer first terms of peace. You start out offering terms of peace. And within the, bo the book of Joshua itself, what do you read in Joshua chapter 2? The very first conquest of the land is not the city of Jericho. The very first thing that is conquered is the heart of a Canaanite prostitute. That's what God conquers first. God is not a bloodthirsty tyrant who simply delights in the flowing of blood, he delights to show mercy, and the book of Joshua is clear on that point. And yet people find this whole story to be scandalous. But Christians always read the Bible in context, don't we? You have to keep the whole story in a particular context. For you don't read the book of Joshua and says, well, you know, this is what they did then, go and do thou likewise. This book is not a model on how uh, modern nations should conduct themselves. This is a book that addresses God's people. And in the greater context of this book, the land of Canaan is land that belongs not to Canaanites. It belongs, first of all, to the Lord. It's his land. And he has chosen to give this, his land, to his people. But meanwhile, there are these other people, Canaanites, that live there. And they are thoroughly wicked. Archaeology has, has demonstrated that quite clearly, that had the Israelites not removed many of the Canaanites, their whole culture would have collapsed in any case because of the sexual perversions that they gave space to. It's his land. And he has chosen to give this land to his people. And therefore, the Canaanites must be removed. But in doing so, God gives to his people instructions on a kind of holy war that is very instructive to us on the kind of God he is and instructive to us on the kind of life that Christians, the Christian church should live today. God has delivered his people from Egyptian slavery by his might and by his power. God was with his people for four, 40 years, four decades, listening to their grumbling, their whining, and their complaining. Moses leads them up to the very border, but Moses cannot enter. And again, I think you know the story when God told Moses, talk to the rock, speak to the rock, and water will flow from it. Instead, Moses, in his great anger, he strikes the rock. And God says this, you didn't believe me, did you? You didn't believe me. Therefore, Moses could see the promised land, but he cannot enter it. He dies, if you will, at the front door, but he never enters the promised land. And so now we come to Joshua 1. This is a great chapter of transition. It's the beginning of a new chapter, a new book, a whole new era is about to unfold before our very eyes in the plan of God, the redemption of His world, the redemption of His people. But first things first. Moses, the servant of the Lord, is now dead. 
And now Joshua is called upon to fill his sandals and provide leadership for God's people. And so I want us to focus this evening on Joshua chapter 1, and to do so under the theme, the Lord prepares Joshua for conquest leadership. The Lord prepares Joshua for conquest leadership, and we'll first notice the chain of leadership, or you might say the chain of command. Secondly, the equipment for leadership, the weaponry that, Mose, uh, that Joshua must have. And finally, there's this call to Joshua to have no fear, leadership that shows no fear, but rather shows courage. First of all, then, the chain of leadership or the chain of command. The new leader is Joshua, and that is a really great name. Perhaps you've studied that in, in Bible studies. The name Joshua means the Lord wins, the Lord saves, the Lord gives victory. If any Canaanite would say, well, who's your leader? He would have said Joshua. He would have said, the Lord Yahweh wins. It's a great name. And, but he's a leader of Israel underneath the Lord. Clearly, the chapter shows that the commander-in-chief of the Israelite army is Yahweh, because Israel is being viewed here as a large army. Now, any army has a chain of command. The Constitution of the United States assigns to the president, Joseph Biden, the fact that he is the commander-in-chief. He is the commander-in-chief of our armed forces, but underneath him, there's the Joint Chief of Staff, there are the uh, generals who are in charge of the various branches of our military. And the Lord speaks to Joshua here to give him his marching orders. And then in verse 10... Joshua then turns around and then he speaks to the officers of the people, go through the camp, get the people all ready because in three days we're going to start moving. And then in verse 16, the officers speak back to Joshua, they encourage him, they promise their obedience. And verse 18 then closes, only be strong and courageous. Now, by the way, that whole chain of command will be violated in Joshua 9 when the Gibeonites come and trick Israel into uh, forming a covenant of peace with one another. And why was the chain of command violated there? Well, if you read the chapter, Joshua doesn't go to Yahweh and say, show us how to treat these Gibeonites. Show us the way. Joshua on his own, as an officer on his own, just goes ahead and makes covenant with them. The chain of command is violated there. Now, the church today also has a chain of command. It still does. Who is the head of the church? No bishop, no human bishop, no archbishop, no pope. Jesus Christ alone is the head of the church. It's his. He purchases with his own blood. He is still the head of the church. But he appoints, he, uh, he sets aside in the church, pastors, elders, and deacons by which the church is governed. The Bible tells us that these office bearers are under Christ, they are under his word, but they are given the role of teaching, ruling, managing the affairs of God's people so that all things are done within the church decently and in good order. And the offices of the church are ministerial. Now, if you remember your high school Latin, the word mini means less. The minister is the one who does the lesser things. A minister is a servant. The only magistrate of the church is Christ, and therefore the office bearers of the church are ministerial. They are those are offices not to dominate others in any selfish or cruel way. Office bearers must care for us, and then we, in turn, submit ourselves to these office bearers, to their good rule and proper biblical leading. That's why the Bible in Hebrews 13 tells us, Hebrews 13, verse 7, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their faith of their way of life, and imitate their faith. 
And then the writer to the Hebrews goes on in Hebrews 13, verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. There are officers who must give an account to the one in charge. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Clearly, Joshua 1 shows the church already being organized with a chain of command. The Lord Yahweh is in charge. But then secondly, notice in this chapter the equipment that is given to Joshua for leadership, the weaponry that he he and Israel possess. If you've ever done some uh, reading in the history of World War II, you know that when the Allies were planning Operation Overlord, the invasion of Nazi Germany with the landings at Normandy Beach, June 6, 1944, there was a tremendous amount of planning. General Eisenhower and all those who were planning this operation had to determine how many soldiers do we need? How many boats and ships will be necessary for this? How many planes must be used? They had to check the weather. What does the weatherman say? What are the days when the weather will be proper for this kind of a massive, massive operation? Because the Nazis were not going to simply welcome the Allied soldiers onto the beach for a cup of tea. They were not just going to lay down their arms and run. You have to meet the, the, the Nazi forces with sufficient force to move them off the beach and, and plant a beachhead to undo Nazi Europe. Well, what does God tell Joshua? Is he going to have Joshua put the Israelite soldiers through a kind of Gideon test? Thousands join Gideon, but the Lord says, way too many, way too many, come on. If you're afraid, go home. So many go home. Way too many yet. And then he has them go through the water drinking test. And finally, Gideon is left with how many? 300 soldiers, that's all. Well, how many troops does Joshua need, and what kind of weapons, what kind of spears, what kind of swords? Gideon, uh, God's directions to Joshua here sound very strange to our modern ears. For in verses 7 and following, this is what Joshua is told. The Lord tells Joshua to be very careful to obey everything That's in the law of Moses. Everything that Moses commanded, be careful to do it. Obedience. But there's more in verse 8. Joshua should speak this law. He should talk about it. He should meditate on it day and night. Think about it, talk about it, do it. All the time. Day and night, day and night, day and night. This is Joshua's equipment. The Word of God. This is the battle plan. Meditate on God's Word. Talk about it and do it. Do you think the Canaanite forces, as powerful as they were, do you think the Canaanites are impressed with this? What about numbers? Ah, yes, we need numbers, soldiers. How many? During World War II, reportedly, uh, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, did something that made the Pope in Rome, Italy, very upset. And the advisors of Stalin said, you have, you have angered the Pope, to which Stalin said, how many divisions does he have? How many troops can the Pope put in the field? Because if he has no soldiers, I have no fear of the Pope. How many divisions does he have? Well, verses 6 through 8 mention just Joshua. Joshua. It's just Joshua. You, Joshua, will cause this people to receive the land. It is as if the whole conquest rests with one man, the man Joshua. Be strong and courageous, for then you will have success. It's all going to rest, humanly speaking, it seems, upon one man, Joshua, the successor of Moses. You get the picture now? 
one man, Joshua, is called by Yahweh to take the land, to the word of God in his hand, embrace it, do it, and then he will be successful. Then he will prosper in everything that belongs to the conquest. Does this sound like a joke? What's the man Joshua to do with this? You're sending me against Canaanite forces, and all I have in my hand is a Bible? Well, the words in Joshua 1 describe that battle plan that Joshua must follow sound a lot like Psalm 1, which we sang earlier. The truly blessed man is the one who has no fellowship with the wicked, but instead his delight, his pleasure, is in the law of the Lord, and on that he meditates. How much? Day and night, day and night, day and night. Is Joshua capable of meditating on the Word of God day and night, constantly? He, if he does, he will be like a tree that's planted by a never-ending river. That tree will always get sufficient moisture so that its leaves don't wither, and when it's time to bear fruit, it bears a lot of fruit, a lot of fruit in season. In all that he does, he prospers. I don't know, but was the inspired psalmist who wrote Psalm 1 thinking of what the Lord said to Joshua back in Joshua 1? What do you think? Did he have God's commission in mind to Joshua? When he wrote Psalm 1, now if you think of Psalm 1, what a beautiful way to enter the the cathedral of the Psalter. It's a wisdom psalm that begins our march through 150 other psalms, but it begins by describing not your best church member. Yeah, I think of so-and-so, he always was knowledgeable about the Word of God, or I think of this dear saint, she was such a student of Scripture. Psalm 1 is a description of Christ. No church member can meditate on the Word of God and constantly find, day and night, and constantly find delight, never-ending delight in the Word of God. Psalm 1 is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. The church has always understood that. And just as Psalm 1 begins our march through the Psalter. Joshua 1 is that chapter that sets the stage for everything else in the book of Joshua. That man who is blessed and is successful is one who delights in the Word of God as that is revealed in the pages of Scripture. He loves God's Word, all of it, all the time. He knows that word. He thinks about it a lot. He's delighted to do it. That man is a person who sinks roots deeply into the soil of life. And then he produces good fruit, lots of it, and right on time. God tells Joshua, if that is your approach to what I gave to Moses... You will prosper in everything that you do. Hard to believe, isn't it? That Joshua's first, his very first instructions is not on the number of men that he needs, not on the kind of spears and shields he should have. His first instructions is that he meditates on the Word of God. And what happens if Joshua is successful in this? Well, then the people of God will take possession of the promised land, and they will enter, and the word is used here, they will enter the rest that God has promised for them. Now, let's take just a moment to reflect on what that word rest means. It doesn't mean rest home. Canaan is not a retirement village where you sit on the porch, you drink, you sip your lemonade, and you watch... You know, the wind devils blow or the swarms of flies and mosquitoes out in the distance. That's not what rest means. The word rest here has the idea of settle down and you're secure. It doesn't mean inactivity at all. You just are settled 
in a land where the enemies are far away, you're protected from them, and what you engage in flourishes. Settled security. You know, this morning we used Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. That's a familiar call to worship. But if you keep reading to the end of Psalm 95, you hear these words. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter, what? My rest. They shall not enter my rest. The church is told to listen to God's voice. Otherwise, we will die as Israelites died in the wilderness. This is clear. For rest in the promised land means living, working, playing, serving in perfect shalom, perfect safety provided by our Heavenly Father. The equipment that Joshua has in hand for the conquest in front of him is the Word of God. But then finally, notice how interspersed throughout this whole chapter is phrases like this, only be courageous, have no fear, be strong, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Because I can well imagine that the man, Joshua, at this time is thinking, here I am filling Moses' sandals, I'm to lead this great people Uh, The Jordan is flooding in front of us. We can't cross it, humanly speaking. Uh, Then beyond that are the great cities of Canaan, and there are Canaanite armies. I would be afraid. And so he's encouraged again and again and again, have no fear, have no fear. And yet what a great future lies before Israel here in Joshua 1 if this man takes the word of God to heart and follows it. But what a kind of strange preparation of the conquest of the land. And brothers and sisters, if we think about this for a moment, if we reflect upon this from the perspective of the New Testament, it really should not be all that strange to us at all. You see, the name Joshua is an Old Testament version of the name that comes to us in the New Testament, Jesus. The name Jesus makes its way through Greek and Latin versions, but it is Joshua. The Lord saves. In Matthew 1, Joseph, the the husband of, of Mary, is told, you shall name him Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Yahweh wins. Yahweh is victorious. Yahweh beats his enemies. Yahweh saves. And this chapter, therefore, really looks ahead. It's looking ahead as a picture from the Old Testament a chapter in redemptive history to what we know now in the New Testament. Think of this. Jesus is standing next to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who has all kinds of soldiers at his beck and call. He puts that Joshua named Jesus on trial. The crowds don't want Jesus as their king. They want Caesar And so Pilate says, well, are you a king? And Jesus says, well, yes, I am. But my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my followers would fight. That's right. You and I are the followers of King Jesus. And we win not by electing our candidates at the next cycle of elections. We win not through swords loud clashing or roll of stirring drums. We win with the equipment that he gives to us. And Jesus even tells Pilate, you would have no authority, Mr. Pilate, unless it had been given to you from above. Earlier in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is about to be arrested, and Peter draws from what? He draws his sword. 
And yeah, he wounds, he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. But brothers and sisters, he wasn't trying to give that ear a nick. He was trying to decapitate the man. The man ducked. And his ear is cut off. But what does Jesus say to Peter? Put it away. Put that sword away because those who live by the sword will die by the sword. That same truth about God's kingdom is being illustrated right here in Joshua 1. The struggle against the enemy is not a physical struggle. It is a spiritual one, and therefore the fight can only be won by spiritual equipment. And the Apostle Paul addresses that, doesn't he, in Ephesians chapter 6. Our conflict is not against flesh and blood. It is against principalities and spirits of the air. And you know, in Chicago, they say you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And we have a lot of them in Chicago. Because if the conflict we face is spiritual, then the equipment and the weaponry must be spiritual. And Paul says this is what we are given in the gospel, the belt of truth the breastplate of righteousness, the readiness for the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. All of this is given to us in the gospel. Think of it. Jesus died on the cross to remove our guilt. The accusations of the devil have been rendered useless. No charge can be brought against God's elect. It is Christ who died. He he conquered death for us by His glorious resurrection, never to die again. He has poured out His Holy Spirit so that that Spirit might take the things of Christ and apply them to our lives. And then we can have faith, courageous faith, a faith that takes God at His word but then helps us to stand up against all of our enemies. Even though we still sin, we still battle sin, even though our consciences may still accuse us, we are confident of Christ's work for us. We hold onto the truth, for Christ's righteousness is ours. We read, we study, we think a lot about what God says in His Word, we discover more truth as time goes on. This does take time, but the, the benefits and the results are amazing and they are rich. And therefore, we have no need to resort to gimmicks, to tricks, to strategies that are political in nature but don't touch the heart. We minister spiritually because that's where the conflict is. And that's where the Spirit does His work in our hearts and in our lives. What kind of war of conquest is this going to be in Joshua? unlike any conflict that the history of the world has ever seen to this point. But it's the kind of conflict that we understand as we stand in the pages of the New Testament, united to Jesus Christ. How many military divisions does Joshua have? Yahweh is not interested in that at all. For whether by many or few, Yahweh gets the job done. But this challenges us, doesn't it? This challenges us to several things. I just want to put these challenges before you, brothers and sisters here in Sanborn. Can we, first of all, can we submit to the Lord's word in humility, seeking his face, reminding ourselves that it is not our wisdom, not our strength, not our cleverness that will win the day? Can we always be confident that God's cause will be successful only because of Jesus Christ? Secondly, What kind of confidence do you have in Jesus Christ as the only leader that we have and need? Do we really believe that our obedience when done in true faith is done having God with us? Third, how are you arming yourself with a better knowledge of the Word of God? Fourth, Joshua is told to do what God says. Well, 
How do God's people today implement biblical principles in their family life, in their personal life, in the life of our country politically, business practices, educational strategies? Can we do that? Will we do that? Working in concert with other believers in Christ. This is a tall order, but who's greater? God or the Canaanites? And finally, is Jesus really Emmanuel? God is with us. If he is with us as he said he would be, Matthew 28, I am with you to the end of the age, then you and I need not be afraid of anything. There was a political leader, I I don't remember who, who at the time of the Reformation said, I would rather face 10,000 armies than one Calvinist who was convinced he was doing the will of God. Joshua 1, therefore, is a glorious introduction to what God is doing for us through his chosen servant. Moses is dead. This Joshua, too, is dead. But we are led today by a new and better Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, though he was once dead and is now very much alive, conquering and still to conquer. He tells us, doesn't he, in John 16, in this world you will have tribulation. In this world you will have conflict. But take heart. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Son, Uh, that great leader, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the greatest King, the greatest Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that we have been enlisted in his army and that even though we sometimes face all kinds of opposition, sometimes very subtle, sometimes blunt and in our face, we are not afraid, keep fear far from us, but keep our eyes always focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ. As Peter was overcome with fear when he watched the waves, but then was rescued by our Lord, help us to always keep our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you will encourage us by your word and be with us in this coming week, no matter what comes our way, to have our confidence in you and you alone. For Jesus' sake, amen. We respond with singing, we turn to number 484, lead on, O King Eternal, 484, all the stanzas.
At this time, we worship the Lord with our evening offering. Take note that there are two offerings this evening for our benevolent fund, but also for uh, Haiti relief. Following that, we sing Doxology 317, stanza 4, to the great one and three. Brothers and sisters, lift up your hearts to heaven where Christ is, receive his blessing, and go in peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.